Warning, listening to Unleash Your Genius can be good for your health. Symptoms may include looking and feeling better. More energy, healthier kids, and increased productivity. Unleash Your Genius podcast brings you the science, art, and philosophy of health, wellness, epigenetics, and lifestyle. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to the Unleash Your Genius podcast. I'm Dr. Brian. My guest today is Mary Wingo. Dr. Mary Wingo has a PhD in human stress research from the University of North Texas. She's deeply interested in the topic of human stress as the cost to our communities every year is in the trillions of dollars. In addition, millions of people die prematurely or suffer disability needlessly because of preventable exposures to stress. She's also trying to unravel the fascinating mechanisms behind what stress does to us biologically. Dr. Wingo's goal is to empower intelligent non-scientists all over the planet. Her book, her life's work, The Impact of the Human Stress Response, The Biological Origins and Solutions to Human Stress. Her book is a humanitarian work intended to educate the public worldwide about the true causes and costs of preventable human stress. And it's really interesting. It's not what you think. This book is of great importance to not only, you know, it's to the, uh, important to the general public, and I think it's going to transform many lives. This book has been through 18 different edits with three editors and four designers and four professional consultants. And the reason why it's been through all this stuff is so that uh, she can make the, the work readable to the non-scientific community. That is, a, it's, a, it's a work intended to be accessible and understood by everyone, and it's intended to make science more democratic. So just please let me welcome Dr. Mary Wingo. Hi, Mary. How are you? Oh, is this wonderful to be here? It's wonderful to be here, Brian. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thank you for joining me. You know, I'm I'm really excited about today. I'm I'm excited about the the topic that we're going to talk about today. Oh, I'm well, I'm I, well. I'm I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, you know, I, I know I've introduced you already, but can you tell us a little bit more about you? Oh gosh, what what do you want to know? There's really not a whole lot. <laughs> um, I am a I'm a well. I was I'm trained as a scientist, uh, you know, from uh, from Texas, and uh, I moved down here to Ecuador two and a half years ago, and and I moved down uh, basically because I mean I'm a, I'm a real sensitive person, and I found that my own home country uh, was getting to be too stressful, and it turns out that moving down here was exactly what um, I needed to, um, I don't know, synthesize the remaining bit of information for my book. Uh, so that's, yeah. Uh, what else? What else would you like to know, Brian? What's Ecuador like? What uh, is, it must be a slower pace or how, what's it like there? Well, it, it's, Ecuador is kind of a funny animal because, you know, Ecuador it, it's, been a, it's, it's gone through some really prosperous times because it, it's an oil state. And, um, you know, petroleum and minerals, you know, as well as, you know, an, an active, um, you know, um, uh, manufacturing sector. But, um, you know, they, they came in with, with uh, you know, the, the about a 10-year run in uh, high oil prices. Um, they took that money and they just basically they rebuilt, a, like, all of their infrastructure. So you've got, like, parts of Ecuador that are absolutely cutting edge because, I mean, they came on quite late to the technology scene in general. And then other parts that are just old school. And it's right. like they, like, it's like they coexist side by side. And, and let me tell you, it's like as a Westerner, it, it's like one of the oddest things. I mean, it's it's one of the odd, it's great. It's great. But it, it is one of the sort of kind of strangest things to, to have the old school and the like cutting edge stuff just coexist side by side. Nice. So did you write your you wrote your book? Before you moved down there, is that right? No, 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 no. I, I wrote my book like, oh gosh, last October. Oh wow! Um, yeah, twenty years. Twenty years it took to like put it all together because the the topic of of stress and and how it relates to humans is so is so complicated. Um, it probably gives quantum mechanics a run for its money. So it took a long, long time to really put it all together. 
Wow. So let's let's talk about your book. It's it's called The Impact of the Human Stress Response. Yes. Yes. And um it's um it, it, it well well let, let me ask you is there anything you would like to know or or I can just like start talking about it. Let let me let me ask. What would you like to know, Brian? Well, I I like I'm a very simple guy and I you know I when I think of stress, I just think of, you know, I'm I'm stressed out. I have too much to do. Right. And I don't I I know that uh, scientifically I've read into it more that the stress is a major uh, factor in, in our health in general. But I, what I'd like to get to know from you is, you know, how how that affects us. Where does the stress come from? I mean, I'm sure there's many different areas of stress. Um, so yeah, where, where does, uh, what does the stress do to our body? Okay. Okay. Well, okay. From th- this angle, okay. What I'll do is I'm going to kind of geek out and, and, and let me know if I go above your head, just, just, or anybody's head, your listeners head, just let me know. And I will like rewind and rephrase. Okay. Sure. So, so basically, you know, we're, we're looking sort of at a, like a deep philosophical, like say structural problem in in science because we have the problem of of adaptation and um you know we've had oh gosh scientists for well really well over 150 years but really in the last like 75 years really try to like get their heads around what exactly the mechanisms of human stress or adaptation it's the same thing are and basically, um, you know, as time has progressed, you know, and more and more interest has gone on to looking at the um, uh, human adaptive response, um, it, the the field got more fractured. Um, it split off into like these sectors. So, so how are we going to look at stress? Are we going to look at it from a molecular level? You want to look at it from an endocrine level, immune level? Um, look at, let's look at it from the individual organ systems. You want to look at it from a cardiac level, um, cardiovascular level, pulmonary level, you know, just how do you want to look at this? Or, or do you want to look at this from, you know, a, a psychological level? Okay. Cause that's what a lot of us identify. You want to look at this on a community level, political level, ecological level, uh, economic level. How, how do you want to break this down? So, so basically th- this is, this is why it took so long is that the um the study of stress became very very fractured and um although there was incredible information being pumped out it was so fractured that the general public um you know had had I mean there's there's so much lingo there's there's so much uh you know various ways of studying stress that that there has been no vocabulary developed for the general public who really needs access to this information um many many years in the making but yet no one's really put it together. I kept waiting for somebody else to do it, but nobody else was doing it. So, and we were getting so bad. I'm thinking, oh my god, I, I, no one else is going to do this. I'm going to have to just do it. <laughs> so, Mary, you you mentioned that uh, adaptation and stress are the same thing. Can you can you walk us through adaptation? What what do you mean by that? Yes, yes. Okay, so here here we get to the geeky part. Um, one thing that we have learned from really, really looking at the adaptive responses is that the organism, you know, when, when faced with a stressor, it goes into like, you know, uh, two, two different modes. You can go into like a mode where the defense response causes you, your tissues to become more rigid and less, um, uh, less influenced by the environment. Or if you fall into the adaptive part of it, like you're trying to change your body uh, in some way to fit what the stressor is demanding, then you go into a more plastic state. So, so the, the shape of your morphology, the, or I should say the shape of your tissues, the shape of your body, so to speak, actually changes. And and these are just mechanisms, okay? So there's nothing uh, heavenly, divine, metaphysical about it. These are just these are just adaptive mechanisms that 
basically all living organisms uh, at some level or another have developed in order to adapt uh, to the environment. Now, the environment has um, two basic aspects, and this is the reason why we act like we do, why our bodies respond like they do. You've got aspects of reality that follow the more routine, um, cyclical aspects of life. Um, you know, the, we get up every morning at a certain time. The, the sun sets you know, every day at some certain time, we eat meals, we, we have our rituals and, uh, you know, we plant our crops a certain times of the year, that, that kind of thing. We have schedules and, and that's how we live most of our life. But, but then we have these little pockets of craziness that come in that inter, inter, uh, inject tons of novelty, tons of erratic new stuff. And that, is what we call, this is when we usually go into the classical stress response, where we become more adaptive, uh, where we become more plastic, so to speak, in order to, um, in order to adjust to that particular demand at that particular time. So the stress is actually something on the outside putting pressure on the body. It could be a physical stress. It could be an emotional stress. So you do you want to are we built to, I mean, obviously there's a certain amount of stress and then we can adapt to that. But then once we go over a certain threshold, our body can no longer adapt. Is that where it, it would affect us in a health situation? Bingo. Okay. So you, basically what, you know, and, and, and then this is something that your grandmother, you know, your mom probably you know, would have would have told you. Yes, absolutely. Um, you follow. Um, well, I should say organisms in general follow this predictive pattern. Um, it's a three stage pattern called the general adaptation syndrome. And um, what happens is you have an initial stage where it's the alarm stage where, you know, you come face to face with whatever stressor that it is. And so I'll just use an example, um, you know, that's it's really clear for people to understand adjusting to altitude because this was something that's very, very common with foreigners coming to the Andes um, because we're way up high. I mean, we're 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 way higher than m many many parts uh, of the Rockies. So you know, make the Rockies look little tiny, you know, compared to you know what um, the type of altitude uh, you you have in South America, and. Um, you know, because the oxygen gets extremely thin, you have to remodel entire parts of your uh, pulmonary and cardiovascular systems in order to not going to um, not going to shock um, cardiovascular shock. See, you see what I'm saying? So, so what what happens here? Okay, so there's a demand. You know, all of a sudden you go from like say sea level to like eight thousand feet up in the air, and then. All of a sudden, your body detects, hey, um, this isn't the same amount of oxygen as we, we have. So, oh, okay, well, we need to reorganize ourselves so we can be more efficient at catching what few atoms of oxygen are available. So, you see, the, uh, the body has its own wisdom where it can basically turn to sort of like a jelly as it's figuring out how to reconfigure and adapt to the um, current environment. Now, you keep... Because stress is additive. You keep adding these stressors. Say, say you have, okay, you have the stressor of, um, of, of, of altitude, and then you have the stress of, like, say, smoking, and then you have the stress of, like, getting, um, you know, getting, a, you know, a chest flu on top of that. You, well, you can see very easily where putting, like, these stressors on your, on your um, you know, your lung system you know, okay, so so you already have the stress of being in, in high altitude. Then you have, like, say, the stress of smoking. Then you have the stress of a, of a of an actual infection, where if you don't watch it, you could you could pass the threshold after your resistance stage to where you go into straight into exhaustion and you lose function, and at the very very worst, you just die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you lose your ability to have the issue just, okay, you know, just quits functioning. And that's how all diseases form. All Every single disease that we know of, every bit of pathology that is known um, to, like, you know, to organisms in general stem from the adaptive mechanisms fatiguing 
and whatever tissues that are affected just becoming fatigued and pooping out. Every disease. Every disease. Every disease. This is how um, the etiology of pathology <laughs> occurs. Yes. Okay. So nice. Okay. So your book dives pretty deep into this, obviously. Does it, um, it it's more than just a self help book, right? Well, well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, this, I wanted to write because, because th this topic is, everyone's interested. In it. Everybody wants to know about it. Very few people have got a really good grasp. I mean, especially, you know, medical practitioners. I mean, got, I mean, they know, they know it affects their, their patients, they, but they don't have, there's no good contemporary overview of what, how, how, I mean, the really kind of funky science behind this and what it really, really means um, in modern society to be stressed in modern society. And, you know, it, it's just, it's one of those things, Brian, that, that it, we're really coming upon what I, I see to be some really severe humanitarian crisis, hmm. especially in North America. And probably Europe, well, a lot of places, due to preventable stress, <laughs> and it's like something has to be done. No, nobody else was coming. I mean, there's a lot of researchers that were that were coming out with little bits and pieces, like you know, trauma, you know, the, the effects of trauma, the effects of workplace stress, you know, the effects of uh, relationship stress, but nobody was putting this all together to actually see what stress truly costs the world mm. and and it's just and at this time because inequality in um government or uh, inequality in society um really really uh, causes an explosion of stress related diseases especially men um i mean it's getting so bad that that we're really really looking at some humanitarian issues and and this is why i came out with the book okay so you have some, uh, so, okay, so it's a humanitarian issue. I, I guess it's the society that we live in. You were, you were mentioning the Western civilized world that we must be under more stress than other, other um, what's the word, other civilizations? Is that? Is, uh, yeah, 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 other, yeah, other, other societies cultures. that, uh, yeah, yeah, other cultures that um, haven't really adopted the full modernization development um you know scale that that we have um but yeah yeah so so basically there there's five causes brian um five causes of the modern society um you know that that causes uh, the explosion of stress and and early deaths that that we're we're really re they're really starting to explode and and so really very quickly i'm going to go through this so the first is simply complexity, or I also call it loss of working memory. Um, this is, uh, again, leading a very complex uh, life with high cognitive load where you're always, you know, multitasking, overscheduled, messing with something. You know, you're always engaged on a cognitive or emotional level with something and not getting much of a break on that. That is extremely toxic. Um, we think that, you know, it's being productive. We think it's the Protestant work ethic. Actually, it, it causes a tremendous amount of damage to um, our frontal lobe over time and our ability in the future to solve problems and regulate our emotions. So that's not a okay, muscle so that you can build. You know, like I know stress, if you stress your muscle, you can build it. Uh, stress of work and things like that. Can you build that muscle as well? That Oh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, we're meant to be adaptive creatures. But when you're, you know, okay, but see, see, understand that stress is, is supposed to be employed. The stre stress mechanisms are supposed to be um, employed only sporadically. Right. They're not supposed to be something that you contend with day after day. And, you know, especially wasting it on something stupid like traffic. You know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, this is a true waste. I mean, like for what it costs, like in the long run and what it provides in the short run, it's like an absolute no brainer. But but we ex the 
structure of our societies tend to kind of push us in these um, realm, you know, and again, there's that guilt factor, like, you know, you've got to be busy, you've got to stay, and and this just isn't how we're put together, Hmm. you know, we're supposed to have, you know, leisure punctuated with high adrenaline, you know, and that is what keeps us in optimal shape. I mean, that's what keeps us in condition. So like a bodybuilder, like a bodybuilder would work out and then he takes a break, right? And then recovers and then works out again. And then there's, there's a, there's a stress and then there's a break. But like you mentioned, traffic, the traffic is, you know, every day. And then, yeah. and then the stress when you get to work or the stress when you, mm-hmm. okay. So it's that constant without a break. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. The constant without a break, just engaging your brain, you know, and again, I mean, I got rid of my TV years ago cause I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I realized for, I'm, I, it just wasn't working for me and you know, it really does kind of mess up and you know, again, you want to be careful with the devices. You're just constantly, you know, you know, that this stuff, this really affects you over time. So that's just number one. Number two is inequality in society. I mean, this has been looked at just every which way, you know, that you Mm. can look at it. And whenever you have unequal um, access to resources in a society, um, people are going to get desperate. And when you get, you know, as a group, when people get desperate, um, you know, really ugly things happen. You know, they get stress-related diseases, um, early deaths, again, especially for men. Um, you know, and, and, it, and it's just, it's, uh, you know, then you have those crazy little revolutions, you know, which throws everything topsy-turvy. Revolutions are caused by stress. And they're not caused by human beings at rest. They're, you know, caused by human beings in severe distress. So that's another. Number three is a loss of social capital. That's a social support. Um, um, This is extremely important because in many cases, social support, uh, social capital replaces financial capital. And when, you know, uh, the financialized system that we have um, puts a people under a tremendous amount of pressure on obtaining capital, I mean, direct capital. When uh, much of uh, society was spent in like the various barter and trade um, type mechanisms that spontaneously develop in um, well-preserved social groups. Okay, so we have that. Then we have, changing gears a little bit, we have derangement or loss of human biome, which are the critters that exist um, within us and on us. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, basically our extensions are of our uh, organ systems, depending which organ system you look at. And, um, you know, believe it or not, when you mess these things up, which is very easily to do in a modern society, um, that's a tremendous amount of uh, chemical stress. I mean, this is where a lot of autoimmune diseases uh, pop up. I mean, just a lot of problems like asthma um, is hypothesized asthma. Many types of uh, mental illness. I, again, when um, you know parts of your immune system and your endocrine system are not functioning, when you're not producing the vitamins um, that uh, certain bacteria produce in your gut, um, it, you know, over time, you know, 10, 20 years, this can really affect a human being's functioning. So you got that. And then the fourth is just chemical stress, whether it's, you know, chemicals of a modern society that we use on ourselves and our houses, whether it's pollution, um, uh, you know, the uh, earth, uh, water, uh, or air. Um, these are all potent chemical stressors. So these are just an overview of the five chemical stressors that we have. Um, and and what, what we can do about these is, um, I mean, they're basically the only thing you really can do. There's no magic pill. You're not going to get out of this by taking a pill, okay? You're going to get out of this by just sitting down. Now, the, like, if you've got the vocabulary of these five major categories, sitting down like you would, like, say, a, a budget or, like, a food diary or a money spending diary and outline every single one of the stressors that you have under those five causes and just realize that w- what you're losing 
um, is tremendous, especially right now, especially where the health system is getting kind of dodgy. Um, and we just can't, you know, easily run, um, you know, and get everything fixed, you know, like we could maybe 20, 30 years ago. When parts of our society are under stress, we, people need to realize that, that they need to take a few things as much as they can in their own hands in order to reduce the complexity in their lives so they are more resistant to a more um, unequal, uh, stressful um, political and social environment. Wow, that's um, yeah, that really opened my eyes. I I had uh, the first three just I had never never considered as a as a I guess you would consider it a stress, but you wouldn't think of it as affecting an individual's health, the complexity or um, the inequality in society. It's amazing. What's it's Terry? I mean, seriously, seriously, it you know. Uh, <laughs> One thing that the fat cats and the point zero one percent or whatever it is, you know, the, the folks that are controlling our society right now. Yeah. Um, well, one thing that they're not realizing that it's only lower stress when you're on top of a hierarchy that is stable. OK, so when everyone is happy and you don't have uh, insurrections from the peons. Uh, yeah. OK, that's when it's great to be big guy. But when you are a leader of uh, the head honcho of an unstable uh, hierarchy, you're under more stress than the peons. Hmm. So, uh, and, and you know, the chances of you losing everything, you know, everything that made you the top dog in the first place become very, very high. It becomes a very risky environment. Okay. So, you know, I, you realize that you know a lot of folks in that situation don't have a lot of empathy <laughs> for uh, peons. But but what I am doing, I'm appealing from this from like an actual, uh, you know, like, you know, if, if you want to preserve wealth at the very top, you have to make sure that the folks at the bottom aren't placed in a desperate situation. When you have groups of people at the bottom that are placed in desperate situation. That is when the adaptive mechanisms hop in, and that's when things get unstable. And it gets unstable for everybody, not just the folks at the bottom. Mary, I was reading you, uh, something that you wrote about relational stress. Can you, can you dig into that a little bit? Well, yeah. I mean, this all kind of ties in together. Um, if anyone asks you, what, what is like the most potent stressor uh, we humans um, face? And that is social stress, relational stress. I mean, I mean, this is the cause between the spouses for, and neighbors. Is that? Oh, oh just, well, it, it's not just that. Just I mean, this is what you know ultimately causes um, you know unequal societies. This is what causes breakdown in social capital. <laughs> Um, you know, so we're not just, yeah, it can be uh, within uh, families, it can be within communities, it can be a breakdown of uh, communication, uh, you know, uh, within a government uh, structural, you know, that level, bureaucratic level, um, you know, a workplace stress, uh, you know, how much of workplace stress is due to lack of empathy uh, from the man top management, you know, they're losing you know, probably minimum, you know, 10 to 20 percent um, of revenue or efficiency, to, you know, in order to keep revenue from flying out the door, from keeping costs from flying out the door, just from lack of empathy and not like understanding how human beings are put together. I mean, you know, it, it's not just, you know, the boss getting an ego trip under a stressed you know, like say workplace situation, which is ultimate in relational stress, uh, it's very unprofitable. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, any way you want to look at it, how are wars caused? How are, you know, um, 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 diplomatic relations between countries uh, strained? This is relational stress. Mm. And usually lack of empathy. So, you know, then again, we have to look at the role that empathy plays in the development um, of a, a healthy civilization. Mary, for our listeners, what are, what are a couple of things that we could do right now to, uh, to help ourselves out to reduce that stress? Okay, well, you need to really, well, number one, 
get my book or just surf my uh, website. I mean, because it's going to, you know, it, this is very, very low cost. Almost anybody in the world can afford this. Uh, I made this purposely to where, um, you know, anybody in just about any community in the world can have access to this information. But what 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 you need to do is you need to understand those five causes, okay? You need to realize that stress is additive, okay? So if you think that it's macho to go and work, you know, 60 hours a week and then come home and, um, you know, be on the phone three hours with, you know, with the telephone company, you know, with insurance company, you know, trying to get, you know, or a bank, you know, trying to get, you know, whatever glitch fixed, fixed. And then, you know, okay, oh, I, I need to take the car um, to get registered. And you're just constantly at that level. Um, y- you're asking for long-term losses uh, for you and your family. We're talking financial losses. We're talking loss in the capacity to work, perhaps early disability. Or we're talking perhaps loss of a breadwinner um, or early death. Hmm. Okay. So I, I, what I'm asking, you know, people don't have this vocabulary. Nobody's ever framed it like this. If you just kind of look at it like a risk basis, you know, kind of like sort of like, like how, like if you should wear your seat belt, you know, when you're driving 90 miles an hour, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yep. You look at it from a risk analysis a, a, a perspective and it, you know you can just f- follow you know the outline that I have in my book the structure for just literally itemizing the stresses in your life and figuring out which are voluntary or you or you could use a you know a support group or you can use a you know a, a therapist or you can just do it yourself mm-hmm. you can do you know however whatever means anybody no matter what their socioeconomic status is, can benefit from that. But you have to remember, stress is additive, and the more you keep adding, the higher the risk, the more expensive it's going to be. Right. Hey, Mary, as chiropractors, we talk about uh, the nervous system quite a bit, and a, a lot of conversations come down to like the, the relationship between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, I would I'd be interested in any light you could shine on that subject as as uh, as a scientist about about the nervous system and how it how it runs how it runs our bodies. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, now you know a lot of times a lot of folks just okay. You know, you, you know your readers uh, are probably familiar with you know, what's called the fight or flight nervous system, you know, pretty much everybody's got a good handle on that. And then there's another part of the nervous system called um, the rest and digest. So the fight or flight, um, you know, and again, we don't want to like just overwhelm people with lingo. um, So, you know, they can just ignore the big words and just focus on the um, function. But the, uh, the, the fight or flight, um, it, as well as, uh, well, okay, the, the fight or flight, that is the sympathetic branch of um, what's called the uh, autonomic or automatic nervous system, just automatic responses more or less. And then the rest and digest is the uh, parasympathetic branch of the automatic nervous system. And so like we were talking about earlier, remember we were talking about earlier that there's two aspects of reality. You've got the more cyclical, repetitive aspects, and then you've got the um, occasional uh, novel, uh, abrupt aspects. Yeah. Well, the, right there, there is the nervous system aspect that deals with that particular aspect, those particular aspects of reality. Of course, the parasympathetic is the daddy of the systems, okay? People like to think that perhaps the paras- uh, the, the um, fight or flight branch of this nervous system is the boss. That is not true. The older, more evolutionary, older branch and the one that really kind of controls the basic functions is the parasympathetic and that basically runs the repetitive cyclical aspects of your reality that helps facilitate that okay Okay. and then when you hit an aberration a novel event whether good or bad that's when the pair the sympathetic comes in and says hey is this is this a threat 
what, 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 what is this? You know, how, how do we assess this? And then you have um, the cascade of the um, uh, of the uh, adaptive response that extends into the immune system, into the endocrine systems, uh, into well, of course, the individual organ systems, of course, mm. um, and then of course into the molecular systems as well. So it. it See, we, we never really looked at it like this, but, but this is a really comprehensive view that really, as you know, anatomy, physiology, pathology is real disorganized. And it's absolute hell if you're, when you're a student trying to take this. Well, this really kind of cleans it up and makes it, well, you know, hopefully simple enough that Joe Average, the average person who's intelligent, but doesn't have access to the lingo that we spend a lot of money getting, um, right. <laughs> cramming in our heads. But and and they pay for this, uh, you know. Usually, directly or indirectly, um, our educations are funded by ta- taxpayers, and um, they they deserve to have, especially something as important as stress. They deserve to have something that that they can understand. Um, you know, that, that's in plain, may not be always English, <laughs> but in a plain language that just somebody with like maybe an eighth grade education, but who's smart can understand sure. and apply. Yeah. And so, yeah, you, you can see that this kind of turns physiology a little bit, um, the textbook, how, how, how we understand it on its head a little bit. Can you measure that, the, uh, the nervous system, parasympathetic and the sympathetic? Could you measure that in someone and, and know if they were out of balance or if they were overstressed? Well, uh, of course, you know, you can always uh, uh, measure the um, end result of the uh, uh, sympathetic by looking at the adrenaline levels and the cortisol that that's always a great you know the, the adrenaline is great uh for short term um usually you know like immediate responses um and then the cortisol comes in for the long haul you know um because it's not a rapidly acting uh, it's a steroid so it it's a sort of a a slow acting um response where the adrenaline response is okay we we need this in like a quarter second you know a bear is like looking me straight in the eye and i, I need to mobilize like right now you know or, or a kid has stepped out in front of my car and I need to mobilize like right now. And so, uh, you know, we, uh, um, you know, we can look at those aspects, but, you know, you know, I kind of wonder, and this is probably, you know, it's going to take several years of, of analysis. Um, but yeah, you could probably, um, you know, factor in a myriad of immune factors or other endocrine factors, um, you know, and just, you know, take some, you know, perhaps some enzymatic factors from various organs. And you could probably compile something. Um, I, I mean, this is very new and novel, but you could probably compile something that could really ultimately give you some sort of aspect, something that you could do risk management with. I'm, I'm certain um, that, you know, I could probably do it if I had the time. I just don't have the time right now. But, um, you know, because, you know, we, we've got um, analytical chemistry of the human down pretty good and it's pretty cheap. Um, it's just sort of maybe putting something together and doing maybe a meta-analysis that we need. What about heart probably rate? Probably so. Heart rate variability? Does that... Oh, yeah, yeah. You could also include heart rate variability. The only thing with that is that you have to have actual equipment uh, hooked up. And and that there, you know, being like in a white coat atmosphere could affect, uh, you know, could activate, you know, the person's sympathetic response, thus distorting. So, uh, you know, one thing I learned as a scientist, the more you can get into the more natural, like be able to test something from a, you know, like say blood or urine or saliva, you know, something along. And the more you can do it, saliva is great because um, a lot of times you can just, um, you know, like send, <laughs> they, they, they look like these little uh, cotton swabs, uh, you know, and you can just have people chew on them and, 
um, you know, just put them in like a little test tube and, you know, you can collect them at the end of the day. Uh, and that's, you know, you can do some real naturalistic um, investigations with that. But yeah, um, I, I mean, this is all very, very new um, and um, definitely something could be patched together and something cheap too. Hey, Mary, I've got this question that I ask all my guests and uh, I would, I'm really interested to see what you what you come up with here. Um, so I just want you to imagine that you've been invited to be a keynote speaker in front of a, a large group of people that are embarking on changing their lives and changing their lifestyles, you know, eating and exercising and meditating, reducing their stress. What were what would be maybe three things that you would want to cover in that speech to, to help these people and and why? Well, again, I, I'm definitely hammer those five causes. Right. Of stress and really, really, you know, give many examples, uh, you know, maybe, you know, have like an extra handout that covers, you know, so if, in case people can identify, maybe, you know, have like a huge list where they can circle examples, you know, to really, really make it easy. And so, I mean, because because that there, that what what you can control in your own life, I mean, that that's the first thing you can control. You can't control what governments do you can't control you know <laughs> you know the future you know that your you know country might you know bring you know and 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 the adverse effects that could affect you and your community but you can control yourself and again you know no, again i keep hammering this really really understand the additive effects of stress and then understand what we were talking about um, a few minutes ago, the stages of stress. So to be able to recognize uh, when you are starting to give out, when you have reached the end of your biological credit card, you've reached that limit and you're in that point of tissue dysfunction or even outright failure, how to recognize this and not try to like be macho or, you know, the typical American way of just pushing the pedal to the metal, burning candles at both ends. This is very expensive and it's very damaging for your family and your community um, to carry on like that. I mean, this is not a way, um, this not, especially in the way society is now and where affluence is very quickly draining um, from the average person, you really need to build up that social capital and you really need to, you know, be able to simplify your life where you're not thinking all the time in order to be able to think clearly to solve more problems, to solve the rest of the problems in your life. But, but this is very, very important. And this is all preventable. This isn't rocket scientists. We're not – this isn't hippy-dippy, you know, uh, idealistic, you know, utopian vision, although it might sound like – this is stuff that can be done and that – can really make a huge amount of difference without costing hardly anything. So simple and yet so effective. Well, yeah, it's just, this has just been a long, long time in the making. I mean, I'm telling you what, even Pavlov, you know, looked at aspects of stress. I mean, we're going back, you know, close to like what, like uh, the industrial age where some brilliant thinkers came out and, and it was all very piecemeal and now it's finally all starting to come together for people to actually use. It's not just curious artifacts. It's like, oh, okay, well, you know, this is why we don't want our cortisol jacked up all the time. I mean, this is the result of having, you know, high adrenaline and cortisol all the time um, rather than just periodically. Um, you know, and, and, and yeah, it's just, uh, I guess, a little bit of a paradigm shift. Yeah. Um, Make make things simpler, easier, more easily digestible. Hey Mary, where can uh, people find your book? How can we? Well, well, they they can find my book at marywingo dot com and also amazon dot com. But they can get started. They can get a free a excerpt from my book on you know how to get started. This framework, you know that you know when you need to sit down and make this inventory, you can get that free off my site. Just sign up for it. Okay. Okay. And if you also need, if they also need consulting, if businesses need consulting, how to handle their human resources, if they need coaching, although I am limited on time, 
I sometimes have like an open space in my schedule. Just give, just drop me an email, and we'll, I can see what I can do for. They you. can find you on your uh, on your website. Yes, marywingo dot com. There will be links to uh, to all of this stuff on our show notes page as well at unleashagenius dot com. So they'll be easily you'll be easily findable. Wonderful, wonderful. And this has like been such a pleasure. And, you know, if there's like other angles you want to look at stress, I mean, if you want to go more physio, if you want to look at the more social economic aspects, if you think that will help your listeners, just have me back. We'll, we'll talk about whatever, whatever you think your listeners might need. I could go on forever. I'll definitely have you back. And <laughs> thank you so much. Mary. I could <laughs> thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Unleash Your Genius with your host, Dr. Brian Peterson. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit UnleashYourGenius.com. We'll catch you next time. Hey, what's up? I hope you guys liked this episode. And if you did, I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe. And most importantly, give us a review and give us a five-star rating too, please. All right. See ya. Oh, wait, and don't forget www.unleashyourgenius.com. Come check us out.